it has uh, been Gail and my distinct pleasure to be here. We go way back with the Homers, further than just me and you. My dad, uh, Lloyd Ledvetter, who pastored churches down in the Texas area and started so many. He was a church planner, started so many churches. Um, we supported Leland Homer. And uh, uh, we were sad when, uh, with his untimely death. And your mom is a hero. She stayed with the stuff. And I've known them. And then they produced David. And, and uh, when I first uh, met him, was at Pacific Coast Baptist Bible College, where Gail and I were professors there. And uh, he was a student. But we were about the same age. So they, he was as old as a professor you know, <clears throat> when he came there, which means, um, uh, yeah, well, I won't, I won't, I won't tell you uh, how, old, how old we are, but the, the, the rocks were soft back when we, when we knew each other. Um, and I love this church. I love this setting. Everything is first class, and it's so intimate. The setting is so intimate. Um, when we, uh, when I went to the church in um, in Fresno, it was in Fresno at that time. It was a very unhealthy, very unhappy church, and um, our first job was to try to get the church healthy and happy, and we we succeeded in doing that. And when it became healthy and happy, it started growing, and we moved from that place to another place, built an auditorium. It looked a lot like this, about this size. And God just kept things moving, and we went to two services, and then we had to go to three services, and so we should build a building, so we built another building, and we lost that intimacy, because that, that building, is, it just seats so many people. But I've got some pictures I want to show you. There's a group of people praying for you right now, praying for me right now, from Sunrise Church. This is a this is our church uh, there in Clovis, California. Sunrise with an O, S-O-N-R-I-S-E. Um, we we uh, now have grown to the point where we have two services in this building here. And um, I'm ready to let somebody else do it from, you know, I'm, I'm too old for this sort of thing. And um, so uh, pray for us as we pray for you. Uh, we really are facing some of the same cultural struggles uh, we may be different cultures, but we all are in the body of Christ. In the body of Christ, we face the same struggles and the same difficulties. I have found in traveling all over this world, I do family uh, ministry workshops all over in Russia. When I met with uh, uh, 300 people in Russia, I, I, I didn't think they'd give me a visa. And they gave me a visa, and I went in. There was a 10-year visa with multiple entry. Uh, multiple entries and so we'll probably be going back but we went there family ministry workshop they called it uh, a cultural exchange and yet it's exactly what I presented here the churches and the Christians and your brothers and sisters in Russia are suffering the same things that we're suffering in the states and that you're suffering here when I was in India we, we spoke in New Delhi we spoke in Pune we spoke in Chennai and uh, went over to Thailand, spoke there. They are suffering, your brothers and sisters are suffering the same things that we are suffering. I was invited to go down to Guayaquil, um, Ecuador, and there I met Fernando Lay, who pastors a church in Quito. And at that meeting in, in, the, in the, uh, Guayaquil, he said, I need to talk to you because we said a few things about family ministry. And his church, so it's a large church, a very, uh, it's a very influential church in Ecuador. It runs about 7,000 on Sunday. It's got a 50,000 watt radio station. Um, it's got a huge Christian school with it. It's got all kind of outreach. But the family was falling apart and they had to do something about it. Your brothers and sisters in Ecuador suffer the same thing that you suffer and that we suffer. And that is the onslaught of the evil one. And the family is the uh, single cell of society. It is the single cell of society. And if the single cell of society is unhealthy, then society is going to be unhealthy. If this, this church is made up of families, if the single cell 
the family is unhealthy in this church. This church is going to be unhealthy. And that's what I found out in, in the church that I was called to in 1986. I've been pastor there of this church. It was Chestnut Avenue Baptist Church then. When we moved it on the 20 acres where we are, uh, it's, it's now Sunrise Church of Clovis. Um, but uh, it, was, it was unhealthy. And I realized, that's when I started family ministry, that I had to help the families get healthy. And that's when the first book came out. And from that point, there's been 17 more. And... Uh, the resources we have, they're just needing all over the world now, and we're just making them available uh, as, as, as best we know how, as best we can. Now, I want you to meet my family, because people say when you talk about family, before you tell me about my family, tell me about yours. In other words, is what you're saying, did it work for you? Because if it didn't work for you, don't tell me. Um, and I think that's very fair. This is my family. I have three children. They each have four children apiece, and um, we've, so we've got 12 grandchildren. And something very unique happened. The first 10 of my grandchildren were girls. <laughs> the first 10 were girls. And uh, I said to them, you know, can't at least one of you drop a boy for me? I, I thought I was going to have to buy a dog, a male dog, to have any, any other male in the family. The estrogen, let me tell you, it was thick around the table, dinner table. But then here, here are the grandkids right here. And you see, um, I, I want to point them out to you. Number one's back there. And then they all come through, all ten of them. And then number 11 is Jack-Jack down at the bottom right there. And number 12 is Fenton. So we got two boys and that is all that's going to happen. <laughs> they told me, Dad, no more. Don't look for any more. I don't look for any more. See number nine right there on the right? Uh, you talked about special needs. That's our special needs girl. Uh, she was born with a profoundly underdeveloped cerebellum. And um, they told my daughter Becky that she would never walk. They told her she would never talk and uh, just prepare themselves. And they said with this special need, my, my daughter was saying, why me? Why me? And I think that's probably what everybody says. But her, my son-in-law said, no, why not us? Why not us? What better family to be born into that will take care of her? Little Cassidy is now eight years old. Am I, is she eight? She's now eight years old. She not only talks and makes 100% on a vocabulary, she walks. And, and I, uh, I look up in church, and that auditorium is a good-sized auditorium, and I see her come in the back door from the children's ministry. She doesn't walk graceful, but she walks. And uh, she, is, uh, she is my hero. <laughs> As a matter of fact, what the doctors said that she wouldn't, talk or, or walk uh, next year uh, she's been in special education now they say she's uh, she needs to move up into regular school so next year she'll go into the the regular school system not in the special needs because she's developing so much and I just want to say nobody knows but God God has control of everything and uh, she I'm telling you she had a walker, and she put it aside. They didn't tell her to. She put it aside. And her dad would say, Cassie, get your walker. No. And she walks, and she falls, and she bruises her head. She cuts her head. The, the abrasions on her are incredible, and she cries. And then she gets back up, and she walks again. And she gets back up, and she walks again. And gets back up until she, and walks again until now, while all the rest of the kids whatever they do she can do and she was not going to not be able to do what her cousins and her sisters did it's an amazing thing I'm glad you're having something like that here uh, for the special needs that's wonderful and then the next uh, slide is the one I introduced to you uh, Friday night it is the three windows of opportunity and uh, you that were here will know what I'm talking about but for the rest of you 
What I'm going to say today will make better sense if you understand this three windows of opportunity. On the far left, that vertical line is the receptivity to your values. We all want our children to know uh, and to catch our values, especially our biblical values. But our values, that represents the level of receptivity to your values. The horizontal line at the bottom represents the age of the child. And you see the three windows are separated by age 7 and by age 15. That first uh, uh, window is called the imprint period where the child does not have the ability to reason and you're basically a benevolent dictator. You need to tell them what they need to know. You cannot reason with a two-year-old. And if you try to reason with a two-year-old and that is your style of parenting, I want to tell you, you don't have a prayer when they turn 12. You don't have a prayer. You tell them what they do. You tell them where they go. You tell them what they eat. You tell them when they go to bed. You tell them because you are guiding their life into the next window, the impression period, where they will come in contact with the Almighty God. And at age nine, at age nine, that child will, that child's moral compass will be set. At age nine, the moral compass will be set. At age 13, a child will die believing what they believe at age 13 on the whole. Unless there is a divine invention if it's negative. And at age, 50, at age seven, they go through a transition. You can't parent a child in the imprint period like you parent in the impression period. It won't work. They won't understand it because they're different. Now they can reason. Now they can ask why. Now they can know why you're doing what you're doing. And it's at this age that you're, you're, you can impress your uh, values on them the most. At age 9, 10, 11, 12 is the peak. And there's a 33% possibility that they will come to Christ at that age. And that's as high as the percentage gets in the aggregate. That's for everybody in, in the nation, Christian or non-Christian. 33% possibility they'll come to Christ, at, and it, it will be at that age. Uh, you see the bell curve starts going down around the age of 13, 14, and then into 15. They go through another transition stage, and they go into life, and they test the values that you taught them in the impression period. They test those values against real-life situations to see if they work. And if the values you taught back in the impression period don't work for them, they'll find other values and they'll find other people that have values and they'll try those values because they want something that works. And they go into what we call the game phase. And every coach understands that you cannot play the game. You sit on the bench and in practice you have taught everything that you know how to teach for them to win the game and score. But you can't get in the game. And when they don't play the way that you practice, you call a timeout and you call them to the bench and you say, that's not the way we practice. That's not the way the play goes. You're doing it wrong. So get back out there and do it again. Do it right. You, you as a parent, that's what you do. You call them to the bench. Timeout. Timeout. That's not how I taught. That's not, what, that's not our values. I, I didn't show you that kind of value. I showed you our value. And here, let me talk, tell you again, here's the play, and here's the playbook. So let's talk about it again. And in it, you're in the coaching phase, they're in the game phase. You see how low the percentage goes for them to come to Christ? At, at around age 15, it drops to 4%. Uh, drops to 4%. From 33% in the aggregate to 4%. At adulthood, it rises to and goes to 6%, and it stays 6% the rest of your life. So the greatest place that that child will get your values or come to Jesus Christ is age 9, 10, and 11, around 12, that age. That's where you have it. That's where a church should put its money. That's where a church should put its resources. Yes, we can win adults to Christ. But what we really want to do is not really cater to what we call, quote, unquote, the seekers that walk in off the street, that sort of thing. Very few of them walk in. But look at the number of children you had. That was so impressive when they left today. Boy, that did my heart good. 
This church has a future. And they just left, and you get to write the script for that future. Praise the Lord on that. And so we have, uh, this week I taught several things, and um, in it we have, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have time to go, and I scripted everything I wanted to say today because if you don't, I could talk for 12 hours um, on this. And I have. In Russia, they started at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning on Saturday, and they finished at 7 at night. And it was straight through, hardly any breaks, no breaks. And when I got done at 7, at, at seven o'clock, I was so wasted, I said, I need to go, and they wouldn't leave. They stayed, and they said, you don't have more? You don't have more? No, I don't have any more. I'm sorry. I, I am done. You know, <laughs> stick a fork in me. <laughs> I am done. And um, so I could talk forever. So I've scripted it, and when I get to this family compass, I want to get through it. And uh, those that were here know the compass is the only one we didn't talk about, and I wanted to talk about it today. But there are four things we ask the church to do. Family fragrance, that's the atmosphere of the home. Does the atmosphere of your home, does it warm the heart, or does it tighten the stomach? When your kids come home, which one of those happens to them? The atmosphere of your home, what is it like? And we talked about that, the family fragrance. And that comes out of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 through 18. 16, somewhere around 14 through 18, yeah. And then the second one is uh, uh, family traditions. What traditions do you have in your home? Traditions will, will give identity to your uh, children and to your family. Your identity comes, and you know, you, you only have to take a look at, uh, you only have to take a look at the Jews. They have 70 traditions every year. 70 traditions. And who has been more resilient than them over the millenniums? And they still have their identity. They still have it. And they still have their traditions. And so we talked about traditions. And then the last thing we talked about was family nights or family moments. That time that's scheduled where you have devotions that are fun. You don't bore them to tears. You don't take the greatest thing that's ever happened on this earth, redemption's plan, and make it boring. Please don't do that. And don't be like my dad. My, my dad would try family uh, devotions, and my three of us, my two brothers, one older and one younger, we would take bets on how soon we could get him to stop. <laughs> because my dad thought if it didn't hurt, it wasn't spiritual. It had to hurt. And so 5 o'clock, 5.30 in the morning. What kid stays awake at 5.30 in the morning to hear Leviticus <laughs> read? So we could, about three was as far as he would go before he got discouraged and wouldn't do it anymore. And we would go back and say, <laughs> yes, all right, it worked. The plan worked. So I wouldn't let my kids do that. We, we, we made it fun. And I, we talked about all the fun in it. And Maybe some of the folks will share that with you when we get gone. But today I want to talk to you about the family compass. The family compass. That is the word of God being taught in the home. That a compass points to, true, uh, to, to north. That's what it does. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, he said, fear God and keep his commandments because this is the whole duty of man. Fear God and keep his commandments because this is a whole duty of man. Consider the simplicity of the compass. It does one thing and one thing only. It points north. Not very impressive. That is until you're lost in the woods or you're attempting to navigate the seas. And when lost, the fixed point of reference of a compass provides the only source of clarity and direction available to help lead you home. Take the compass away and you put the traveler at risk. And sadly for this generation, not just in the States, in Taiwan, and sadly for this generation, the spiritual compass of faith and character has been lost. And it is that lost compass that points to true north we need to regain for our children. 
I don't think you ought to cram religion down my child's throat. Does that sound familiar? I don't think you ought to cram religion down my child's throat. That was the theme of an entire generation of, of my era, era. We were raised by parents who found church boring while growing up, so they decided not to put their own kids through the same experience. After all, with, what, with that rationale, they can decide for themselves when they grow up. Well, we are grown up now. That generation is grown up now. And rather than saying thank you, we are saying, how could you? Douglas Coupland, in his novel, this is a disturbing novel, novel that he wrote called Life After God, he captures the spirit of a generation raised by parents who neglected spiritual instructions in the name of protecting their kids from dogmatism. It didn't work. And he says it didn't work. And his story is, he was a young man who traveled from one empty experience to another in the vain hope of finding meaning in life only to discover that he has no story beyond his own. And the result, in his words, let me read the results to you in his own words. He said, I was wondering, I was wondering, what was the logic in the product of this recent business of my feeling less and less? Is feeling nothing the inevitable end result of believing in nothing? And then I got to feeling frightened, thinking that there might not actually be anything to believe in in particular. I thought it would be such a sick joke to have to remain alive for decades and not believe in or feel anything. And he goes on to describe that his state of mind is in part the result of being raised without religion by parents who had broken with the past, who raised their children clean of any ideology, and at the end of history or so, they had wanted to believe. In other words, his folks didn't want to cram religion down his throat. So like the others of his generation, he was given nothing in which to believe. And the result, freedom from the shackles of religious dogma, yes. But the cost, imprisonment to life without meaning. Ours is an era in which nothing is considered sacred to many. God is dead. God is distant. Or maybe the worst of all, God is irrelevant. Objective truth, what should direct and explain life experiences? Objective truth, that's what should explain life experiences. It's been replaced by subjective opinion. We want something better for our kids. We refuse to shove them into the deep end of life, don't we? Without first teaching them how to swim. We want, to, we want them to know that there is something to believe in. There is something to believe in. We want them to know a personal loving God who created them for a relationship. God wanted a relationship with you so bad that He sent His Son. He didn't just open the back door of heaven and holler out the Ten Commandments. He sent His Son to build a relationship to know what you're feeling and what you will feel and what you will suffer and what you will go through so that He knows the feelings of your and my infirmities. And when we pray to Him, we know He's not distant. We know He's on the in crowd. He knows what we're going through. We were create well, He created us for a life of purpose and a meaning that transcends the often confusing and painful experiences we will endure. And I heard pastor talking today about the cancer it's part of it's part of life dying is as much a part of life as breathing and those painful experiences we endure they need there needs to be something that teaches us the greater good for that suffering the profound hope found only in Jesus Christ which can overshadow the deepest despair and may the bitter aftertaste of being raised without God 
inspire our generation to give the next generation something far better. That's my hope, and that's why I do what I do. Every one of these kids that walked out of this auditorium today, every one of them deserve the opportunity to know God and to know His redemption and to know His saving grace. I love the name of your church, Grace Church. I hope you live up to that name. No, we don't want to cram religion down the throats of our children. But we certainly should let them in on a secret to the meaning of life that Solomon discovered. I read the scripture, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Fear God and keep his commandments because that is the whole duty of man. For a man who tried everything, that was his life uh, lesson in a sentence. Fear God. Keep his commandments. That's the whole duty of man. So, you parents, I'm going to give you a bunch of scriptures for you to ponder, and I hope you'll take a picture of them. I hope you'll go back and just study them uh, in, the, in the time you have and compare, so, sort of apply it to you as a father or a grandfather or a mother or grandmother, an aunt or an uncle, a nephew or a niece, whoever you are. If you see scriptures these scriptures, you hide that word in your heart and the power of the word's guiding principles you put in your heart and how they work as a compass pointing us to true north. Passing a spiritual compass requires that we first possess one. You can't use a compass that you don't have. The knowledge that a compass points north, man, if we had one, we'd know where north is. Make sure you have one. Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 through 9, they, they, I think they're, they'll be on the screen for you. Parents, these principles, are it says they're to be on your heart first. It's on your heart first. You can't teach what you don't know. And I, I had a professor, Dr. Noel Smith, he always said this, boys, <laughs> telling people what you don't know is like coming back from where you've never been. <laughs> mm, absolutely right. First, it has to be on your heart. And then Psalm 78, 5 through 8, then teach it to the future generations and don't have a stubborn, rebellious heart like the Ephraim who turned away in the day of battle, he says. And then Psalm 119, 9 through 16, hide that word in your heart. Psalm 19, 7 through 10, the law is perfect. His law is perfect. Psalm 25, 25, lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. In you I wait all the day long. Psalm 43, 4, uh, 43, 3, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and your dwelling. Psalm 86, 11, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. James 1, 18, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And then Proverbs 22, 6. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Train up a child in the way that he should go. And I think that's one of the most misunderstood verses of Scripture on parenting in, this, in the Bible. How many of us have read that Scripture and we've seen people trained up in the way they should go and they left? 70% leave. Said the, the, the statistic is 70% 70 70 cent of the kids raised in a Christian home, raised in church, will leave the faith before the first year of college ends. 70%. So what does Proverbs 22, 6 mean? Then, I want to talk to you about that. And point two in the outline is... Questions to which our children need answers. I'm going to give you, I, I think I have four here, and I'd like for you to really consider these four. The first one is, teach them who God is. They want to know who is God. We live in an era in which there are many different views of God. As individuals, we often develop our own view 
of God based upon personal preferences rather than any revealed truth. Rather than revealed truth, it may be movies that, where we get our theology. So we must help establish normal for our kids but by teaching them the biblical worldview, not the Christian worldview, because Christian today can mean anything. The biblical worldview. Teach them the biblical worldview. Equip them to recognize truth from error. Belief in that there is one God. He is the perfect spirit in whom all things have their source and support. And end. He is the perfect spirit in whom all things have their support and source and end. He is a perfect personal being. He's not an impersonal force. He is just, he is loving, and he cares about you and me, and he cares about our kids. In fact, they don't belong to us. We get them to manage for about 18 years. And then he, they're on their own. Who is God? That's one thing. The second thing, who is the devil? Who is the devil? Is, is the devil real? Most people in our generation fall into either the extreme of belief in or an unhealthy obsession with the devil, in devil worship. So they see evil in the world, but they find it hard to believe that a little guy in a red suit and a pointed tail is the mastermind behind it all. And others become obsessed with the seductive allure of evil or fearful of the mystical forces of demons to the point that they evaluate Satan above his rightful place. So we've got to help our children establish normal by teaching them the biblical view of Satan and his work in the world and that he is real. The devil was an angel created to serve God with many wonderful gifts. But he rebelled against God, led other angels to rebel against God in hopes to get people to join his rebellion. He hates us and he seeks to destroy our souls through temptation and lies. Satan and all who follow him, followed him will be judged by God. I wish I had time to talk to you about the secret place. God has provided a place where you're out of Satan's reach, where you and he together can talk. Three, teach them about God, who God is. Is there really a devil? What is the Bible? You take the, your Bible with you, mom and dad. What is the Bible? There are a lot of ways people see the Bible. Some see it as a great work of literature. Some consider it historical chronicle of the Jews and the early Christians, while still others read it as God's supernatural revelation to mankind in truth the bible is all those and more it is the compass pointing to true north it is the light of truth that dispels the darkness of deception it is quite simply the word of god so we have to help our children find out what normal is and teach them the christian or the biblical view of the scriptures the Bible is God's written word. It's his written message to mankind. It tells us what we need to know about God, ourselves, and, and the world that we live in. And it points to true north. This points to true north by lighting our way. And then the, the fourth one is, why believe in Jesus? The deepest yearning within mankind is to understand who we are and why we are here. Do I have a purpose? Sadly, many don't have answers to those questions. They're robbed of any sense of purpose and meaning. And others have false answers that cause them to live a life out of step with reality. And it's vital that we give our children a sense of normal by teaching them who they are, why they are here, and why they are as they are. We're spiritual beings. We covered that uh, with some evaluations and things. We are spiritual beings created for the purpose of a relationship with God. God wants a relationship with you much more deeply than you want it with Him. Max Lucado said He would rather go to hell with you than to heaven without you. Because we're made in God's image. 
we have a tremendous capacity for good. Due to the disease called sin, we tend toward evil. We have a free will and we're accountable to God for our choices. And let me close with this, the principles of which every parent should be aware. I want to flesh these out for you. The, there are four principles. Don't miss these. In teaching your children, these are the four principles you're going to need. The first principle is the legacy principle. Basically defined what we do today will directly influence the multi-generational cycle of family traits, beliefs, and actions for good or bad. That's the legacy principle. This is a principle that we first must understand as we develop a solid theology of parenting. It's what we call the legacy principle because the legacy principle, it can work for us or it can work against us. And each of us has a choice whether or not to love God. And that choice will affect your family. It will. Then the second one is the likelihood principle. In the context of healthy relationships, and you should underline that, uh, healthy relationships. In the context of healthy relationships, children tend to embrace the values of their parents. Healthy relationship. If you don't have a healthy relationship, they won't embrace your, your values. You need that healthy relationship. Train up a child in the way that he should go. I think the Darby version probably uh, translates this the best. The Darby version of the translation of, of the uh, Hebrew says, train up a child in the tenor of his way. And when he is old, he won't depart from it. Every child has its own bent. Every child, God has put certain gifts into them and they have their own way, certain bent. If you as a parent take that that's bent this way and you say, I don't want a child like that, I want a child like this, you'll probably damage them. Force a kid who loves the arts into sports, he won't be good at it, and he'll hate you for it. Train up a child in the tenor of his way, and when he's old, he won't depart. You stay the same your entire life. You clerics are still clerics. You phlegmatics are still phlegmatics. You sanguines are still sanguines. You melancholies are still melancholies. You're just smarter. But you're the same. In this passage is describing a principle we can embrace as we develop our theology of parenting. It is what we have labeled the likelihood principle. It teaches us that the odds for successfully passing your Christian values increase dramatically when we cultivate a fun loving relationship with our children. Could I hear an amen? You're, you're quiet and you're staring at me and I'm wondering, do, <laughs> do I need to pray and leave early? You know. The likelihood principle. And then the third one is the lens principle. The lens principle is our children need the corrective lenses of truth in order to navigate the deceptive roads of life. What we believe to be true has direct impact on our behavior. Whether we like it whether we don't like it, that's consistent with reality. The more our understanding of the world conforms to reality, the better our choices will be. The more we operate under the false assumptions, the worse our judgments become. Jesus taught that we're part of a battle in which the enemy's primary weapon is deception, which we must, it, it must be countered with truth. It is our job to become intentional about equipping our children with the ability to sort through the deceptions and recognize the truth. Our children need the corrective lens of truth in order to navigate the deceptive roads of life. And the, the D, the last principle, is the learning principle. And I talked about this yesterday, and I showed you how to do this with family nights. I showed you those 12 books that are written, the family night tool chest. That's what it's designed for right here. The learning principle. Our children can only learn what we teach them in a manner that will reach them. Show me a business that does not know its customer and I'll show you a business that is failing. 
The same is true in the context of parenting. Parents who don't understand the basic nature and character of their child are parents who are neglecting or blowing the process of spiritual training. If our goal is to make an impact, we must be willing to think outside the proverbial box in order to engage their hearts and minds. The reality of human nature that forms our theology of children also informs our theology of parenting. And drawing upon their truth, we can glean several implications from the process of teaching our children's values. Reality one, children have a rational, free will which gives them the capacity to understand and choose what is right. That's reality one. But because of their sinful nature, they will tend to choose what is wrong. Maybe your kid doesn't. My kid did. And I thought my kids were the second coming of Jesus. (laughs) And I found out they did wrong. They have a sinful nature, and they tend to choose what is wrong. I always wonder, God got it wrong. You know, he got it wrong. Why, why is it that broccoli and, and asparagus and all those vegetables cause you to be healthy and ice cream cause you to be unhealthy? <laughs> That's wrong. <laughs> who, who would come up with that? <laughs> but our children sort of think that way, if you know what I mean. What's the implication? The implication is we can hold our children responsible for their choices teaching them to counter their natural impulses rather than encourage and excuse them. Oh, they're just children. They're just kids. Oh, boys will be boys. Okay. Reality number two. Children have a conscience with which to distinguish right from wrong. And become, they can become callous to its urgings. They can What is the implication? The implication is we must help them develop and maintain an informed, sensitive conscience by clarifying right from wrong, truth from error. Reality three. Children have an inborn yearning for relationship with God and others, but will resist and resent his or any other authority. That's why in that first window of imprint, you do not let them resist authority because they will learn to resist authority. And you think they have the right to read, they have the power to reason and they don't. You don't allow them to do that. The implication, we should balance unconditional love for their person with conditional acceptance of behavior. To summarize, our children have been created in the likeness of God himself, giving them tremendous potential and awe-inspiring qualities. My kids are my heroes. But due to the fall, they are prone toward evil and deception. And our job as parents is to understand the implications of these realities as we seek to teach them biblical Christian Biblical values. Okay? Notice, okay, I hear you. So what do I do? I wish you'd have been here this week. I laid all that out for you. They've got it all, I think, recorded, and they, I'm leaving the PowerPoint here. We went through and reduced the prices. I'm not here to sell books. I, I don't need to sell books. I made enough money off my books to put one kid through college and two get married. And the two oldest got married within three months of each other, which I thought was awfully rude. (laughs) But we made it. The next step for you is to become intentional. And in becoming intentional, to assess the present situation where you are. In business terms, in business terms, you businessmen and businesswomen, you have to to define the as is before you are ready to move toward the to be. 
answer these following questions. And they're designed to help clarify your current situation. One, am I intentional? Two, do I have a target? Three, do I have a plan? Four, am I effective? And in transferring these over, it left out number five. There's a fifth one. Are they learning? Am I effective? And are they learning? Maybe if you're like most of us, these questions make you very uncomfortable. Just maybe, those five questions will help reveal that good intentions may not be getting the job done. But now that I've been here, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for this church. I believe this church can be the uh, headwaters for a river of information into Asia because all of Asia, I know it is. I work with closely with Focus on the Family. Their director uh, of, of all Asia tells me, your culture is in trouble. And the way to fix it, they all just walked out of this room. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your word and thank you how it changes us. And I pray for every parent here today, every grandparent here today, every aunt or uncle, those who don't have children, but they influence children in their lives. I pray that what has been said in the scriptures this week and today particularly, Father, that we can make a difference. We can make a difference. We can go against the culture. And we can be successful. Because you've already made it possible. You've already defeated any foe we could ever come against. And in your name, we ask for your help today. In the name of Jesus, amen.